So first of all, welcome to this rather intriguingly named uh, lecture, Absent but Implicit, Harnessing the Disavowed Forces of Coaching. And I'm going to break down that, that title shortly and explain why I came to it, because I'm a pretty pretty sort of a stickler for titles, really. I like to really think, what do they mean and why am I choosing each individual word? So I'm going to be sharing the think behind that title. But before I do that, just, let me just kind of share a little bit about uh, who I am, for those of you who don't know me. I see some familiar faces, for sure. But for those of you who are thinking, who's this guy? I'm Nick Bolton. I'm the founder of Animas Centre for Coaching. Been a coach for, what are we now, 2023? So about 20, 20 plus years. Been a supervisor since 2014. Um, started my coaching school in 2008. We've trained about four and a half thousand coaches across the world. And I think we've trained about four, four, no, not that many, about 300 supervisors across the world as well. So it's been an amazing journey. But something that's really, really kind of grabbed my interest for probably the last five years, for those of you who know me, you'll know this is the case. But for the last five years, I've been fascinated really with not so much how does one do coaching, the mechanics of it, but rather what's really happening in coaching? You know, what, what's actually happening in that space between these two human beings? Why does it work? And one of the questions I posed for a long time was why coaching, why now? And in particular, I was fascinated by what were the philosophical sociological anthropological psychological conditions that had to exist in a given historical era let's call it late 20th century early 21st century that meant that coaching was a thing that emerged because why not 200 years ago why not 400 years ago and people often say rather flippantly oh well, socrates was the first coach well if you ever try reading plato i, I can guarantee you he was not a coach you know, Socrates was fantastic at breaking down somebody's thinking, but he wasn't seeking to coach them. So we often use the idea of, of the mere act of being of questioning people as coaching. But that to me isn't coaching. Coaching truly is about how somebody become more, let's say, um, more self-aware and more able to face the truth of where they are and make choices about where they want to be and where they want to go and how they get there. And that wasn't Socrates' place. So there's something very, very unique about the late 20th century and the early 21st century that produced this thing we call coaching. And I found that so fascinating. But then more recently, I've started thinking, because of the, ra the, the rise of artificial intelligence, you no doubt you've seen on LinkedIn quite a lot, the whole debate around AI and coaching and can AI replace coaches and what part of coaches can AI replace? And is there certain kind of coaching that AI can replace? And is there other kinds of coaching that AI can't replace? And all this kind of stuff. And it made me think, what do I think about that? Because it's very easy to go along with the flow and just go, oh, AI, you know, well, fantastic. It's very easy to be fully in with something that you don't truly understand or you haven't truly given thought to, but it's equally easy to be a Luddite and just refuse and you know burn down the factories of coaching that, that are controlled by AI and just be like let's burn it all down we want human beings I don't think either approach is correct I think we need to think to ourselves what's going on in coaching that means AI can or can't replace human beings in either fully or partially and that's what started this whole process now this was initially this whole talk was going to be my talk at the summit this year on the 9th of November um, but I, I decided not to do a talk this year. I decided to give more space for other external experts. And so I decided to do this one as a one-off. And it's a little bit embarrassing in some ways to do this because I feel like it's out of the blue. There I was, sort of semi-retired from Animas, did my last lecture back in April 2022 or something like that. And all of a sudden I pop up again like a weird mushroom. And that feels slightly embarrassing to me. And yet at the same time, this thing has grabbed me. This 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 idea has grabbed me of around around what makes humans different and it's really shaped the whole theme of the summit because as you know if you've seen the summit it's called the vitality of the human presence and that to me was it came out of a conversation with the speakers because as we were looking initially it was going to be about perspectives on transformation the usual kind of thing but as i was talking to the speakers we were thinking about like what is it that's uniquely human about this whole process and can it be replaced by ai now you'll see by my talk this evening that I don't think it can be. I think partially it can. I think that AI can probably be useful. But I think there's some really important things that we do as human beings that simply can't be. No, let me say that again. It's not what we do. It's what we experience and what we are that can't be replaced. Let's say that. It's not what we do. I think what we do can be replaced, but it's who we are in that doing that can't be replaced. Now, little, little, um, is it a confession? It's not really a confession. It's a uh, yeah, a little vignette of animas life when i did this put this this lecture 
theme up, one of my team, Brinsley, is one of our coach consultants. He said, uh, Nick, I've got a challenge you on this. Is that okay? I said, of course, Brinsley, go ahead. He said, is there an ulterior motive to this talk? Is it that you know that AI is going to come along and massively you know, replace coach training and then replace coaches? And you're trying to, you're like in your last stages of battling against AI before it takes over the industry. And I like Brins. If AI really can take over coach training and it can take over coaching, good luck to it. We are, we, we need to be defunct at that point. I don't want to be running a business or doing a job that really isn't needed because it can be done better by something else. But I, and I said to him, I, I promise you, there's no ulterior motive. I am super interested in AI, but I'm also super inter interested in what it is to be human. And so that's what this whole conversation is going to be about this evening. Um, before I came on online, before I came onto this call, I thought to myself, what do I really want to leave you with? I mean, you first of all, thank you for spending time with me and with each other tonight. But, you, you, you know, you're here for a reason. And I thought, well, what do I want to leave? What do I want to leave you with? Selfishly, you know, what do I want to leave you with? And clearly, from a subjective point of view, you'll, own, you'll all take your own thing. But what I would love to leave you with is, first of all, more scope of what to explore within your coaching sessions. Because I notice over the years how much coaches suppress themselves from going where they think is outside of their, the boundaries of the conversation. Like, oh, well, this is my stuff. I can't go there. It's my stuff. And I really want to kind of help you dissolve that, some of those boundaries, so that you can have a, a wider playground of conversation with your clients. And secondly, I want to help you get more flexibility with how you work with relationships. And I'll come to this a little bit in more detail later, but I do think the relationship concept in coaching has been poly analyzed, if that's the right sort of way of thinking about it. We we think of the relationship in coaching being very poly esque Everything's lovely and nice, and we, you know, or, or kind of what was the Voltaire's? Everything's best for the everything is for the best and the best of all possible worlds. It's like in coaching, we sometimes want to make that space so cozy and safe and psychologically safe and let's not do anything that could upset our clients. And I kind of would like to think, how does that relationship become more robust and more honest? Now, I know, I don't know how many people are on this call. I know there'll be some of you going, nonsense, Nick, that's not how I work. And that's great. If you don't work in a Pollyanna-esque way, no problem, great, I'm pleased for you. But having been a coach for... 20 odd years, teaching coaching since 2008 and supervising coaches from 2014 and indeed before that, before I was qualified as a supervisor, I know that a lot of coaches really try to keep their space psychologically safe and all this kind of stuff, but in a way that sometimes holds back the potential for change. And I'd love to free you from, from necessarily being so held back in that. The other thing I'd love to leave you with is the sense that everything happening in a space has value. Now, this is something I used to talk about a lot but I haven't done for quite a, quite a few years. But, you know, everything that's happening, whether it's how the client is responding to your questions, whether it's how, what they're doing physically in that space, it has value. It may not be important, but it has value. In other words, it may be worth exploring. In other words, what happens in coaching is not simply the surface of the conversation, nor is it only the psychodynamic stuff. It's also the practical stuff. Are they, are they taking notes? Are they typing? Are they, what are they doing? What are you doing? And what does that say about what's happening in that space? So I want to kind of give you that sense that everything that's happening in a space potentially has more value than you give it. And finally, I want to give you permission, if that's what you need, and some of you won't and some of you will, to be more truly authentic with your clients. Over the years, 100%, what I can say is that I would say 85% of coaches hold themselves back from being truly themselves. That's what I think. Now I might be wrong, I haven't done any research on that. There's no doctoral thesis coming out here. It's just my gut feeling from watching coaching and supervisors, they hold themselves back from being truly authentic. And I think there's a lot of value to being authentic and I'll, I'll say what I mean by that. Now this talk is gonna be about an hour long. So we'll be finished by about seven o'clock. I've given us an hour and a half, so there could be time for Q and A, maybe some breakout time if that's what people want. But I think I'll squeeze it all into about an hour. However, I've not practiced it. It's not scripted. There's no PowerPoint, as you can see. So I'm kind of going with the flow and I give myself a bit of spaciousness to, to breathe into. Having said all that, this talk is not researched in any shape or form. It came from a, a thought, a thought experiment, really, which I'm going to do with you shortly. But it came from a thought I had when I was driving and I thought, oh, wow, that really taps into something for me as a coach. And I want to go through that. But, uh, but as a result of this, it's not researched. There's no kind of 
There's nothing detailed behind this. It's very speculative. I, I should also say it's not the Animas line. Like if you're an Animas student or an Animas alumni and I say something this evening, you think, well, oh, that's not what I was taught when I was doing my diploma. That's because I've just thought it <laughs> and I might be wrong or the diploma might be wrong or the world might be wrong. It doesn't really matter. This is not the Animas line. This is just me, Nick Bolton, thinking about stuff. And one of the things I'm thinking about within this talk is that I don't think we do the human relationship justice within coaching. I'm not talking about the coaching relationship, I'm talking about the human relationship. And what I mean by that is I think we do one of two things typically. One is we treat it as a byproduct. My first job is to be a coach. Your first job is to be a client. Our, our in-between job is to get a coaching result for you, whatever that looks like. And if there's a relationship that forms in that process, it's kind of a byproduct, a bit like carbon monoxide or something, <laughs> which we hope to dispose of because at the end of that, I want to get away from this person in six sessions paid. And I don't want to have any emotional feelings attached to this person because I was a coaching contract. So we either treat it as a byproduct or we exalt it and we say, the relationship is central to everything. Without the relationship, there is no change possible. I have to create the most fulfilling relationship possible. And we put relationship on a pedestal. And I think both approaches take it to the extreme. I think my gut feeling is the relationship is absolutely the meat and, and or the tofu of what's going on. But it's not the it's not the raison d'etre, nor is it a byproduct we should dispose of. It's something we can work with. And as a result of that kind of binary approach, people either suppress themselves, i.e. Um, it's not about me, or they put themselves too much into the space. Oh, I'm noticing dot, dot, dot. As though something about their noticing is so super important that it's got to fundamentally transform that space. And I think we can need to be a little bit careful around how much weight do we put on our own sensed experience, neither too little, neither too much. In fact, talking about Greek philosophers, Aristotle, of course, talked about the golden mean. In his Nicomachean Ethics, he talked about the golden mean. And I think we should seek the golden mean when it comes to a relationship, or what you might call the Goldilocks approach. Not too little, not too much. But let's let's um, let's look a bit further at this. Um, so as we go through this, we're going to be talking about what's really going on between two human beings. Now, I want to break down the title a little bit, which is Absent but Implicit, Harnessing the Disavowed Forces of Coaching. It took me a while to get to that. First of all, absent but implicit. For those narrative coaches amongst you, you might recognize that from Michael White. He, he came up with the concept of absent but implicit in which characters and themes can be absent from what somebody is saying. And in his case, uh, uh, um, did he call them patients or clients? I'm not sure. But anyway, he was a therapist. So in his case, he, he, he would be saying, well, what's absent from the narrative? But it's implicit. Without it, this narrative wouldn't make sense. And I really always love that title. This is not a narrative themed presentation, but I always love that concept, not title, sorry. I always love that concept of absent but implicit because I think it plays a lot to what we do with deal with in coaching, which is the unsaid stuff. Now, when it came to the rest of that title, I really fought with in or of. <laughs> These are the kinds of things that go through my mind. The, the um, harnessing, the disavowed forces in coaching or of coaching. And my designer got so frustrated with me because I kept flip-flopping between in and of, and she kept saying, Nick, is this the final design before he goes live? And I said, Aki, this is the final one, it's of. And the reason why, because I realized that when you say in coaching, it's like it's not part of coaching. It's like a piece of dust that's settled on your water or a virus in your body or a fly in the ointment. If, we, if, if, this, if this force is in coaching, it's like there's coaching and this thing is separate from coaching, but in. That's not what I'm going to be talking about tonight. I'm going to talk about forces which are of coaching. They are the very essence of coaching, not the only essence of coaching, but they are part and parcel of coaching. They drive the change process. Now, when we think about driving the change process, we think about goals and motivation and inspiration and, and, and clarity and all these things. And these are the avowed. I don't know. Is avowed? Yes, it avowed is the word, isn't it? Of course it is. These are the avowed forces of coaching. Everybody talks about goal setting and aspirations and desire and, you know, what's um who's the chap that does the analytic network stuff? Simon, oh, blimey. Anyway, Simon from analytic networks always asks that Lacanian question, what do you desire? These are the avowed forces. The disavowed forces are the ones we don't like to admit are there. 
the shame, the embarrassment, you know, the, the sense of, of not being enough. But these are critical. These are of coaching. They exist whether we like it or not. The question for me is, what do we do with that stuff? How do we harness it? So instead of thinking we only talk about the good stuff, the, the avowed stuff, we talk about the disavowed stuff. It's there. It's real. The second part of, of that thing is dynamics versus forces. And I realized that dynamics was more about how things move, kind of like psychodynamics. But this isn't that. This is about forces. This is what moves us forward. It's not about how these things interact. It's about what's moving this client to change. So all in all, this is how do we harness those forces that are part of coaching that we like to pretend aren't there, but that ultimately will move a client forward or hold them back. That's this talk, hopefully, <laughs> in a nutshell. So let me tell you my thought experiment. I was driving along and I, I don't know what navigational tool you use. There are many brands, so I'm not gonna advertise any, but I use Google Maps. So I plug in my thing, maybe I was going to see Ruth up in, uh, Ruth is my MD, she's on the call. Maybe I was going to see Ruth up in Coventry where we do our quarterly strategic meeting. And I had my, had my navigational guide on. And I had this thought, if Google said to me, take a left, or like if it showed me, take a left, and I missed it, it would reroute me. And I would drive on and think, oh, I missed that. If I then missed it again, it would reroute me. And I think, what an idiot. But I would drive on knowing that Google had no feelings of ill will towards me. If I missed the next left turn, how impatient would Google be getting? Not at all, it would reroute me. And only I would be getting impatient with myself. I might say, Nick, you're such an idiot. What's wrong with you? But Google has zero, absolutely zero emotional response to me missing four left turns in a row. And then I thought to myself, well, if my wife was sitting next to me or a friend and they said, and they were doing the navigation, I said, hey, Danny, would you navigate for me? She's like, oh, yeah, of course. She doesn't like maps, by the way. But let's say she, she accepted that she was going to be the map reader. And she says, oh, it's left turn, Nick. And I missed it. She'd be like, I said left turn. I'll be like, okay, sorry, sorry, I'll take the next one. And she goes, okay, take the next left turn. And I miss it again. How, would I be feeling the same as I would with Google? Would you? Would you be feeling exactly the same? You'd just be like, no problem. I'll take the next, you know, my, my wife has rerouted me. I'll take the next one. So I miss the next one. Third one in a row. What am I feeling now? I'm not only feeling like Nick, you idiot. I'm thinking... Oh, she must be thinking I'm an idiot. All of a sudden, there's two people thinking I'm an idiot, myself and another person. That's extremely different, isn't it? From an experiential point of view. Whether she is or not thinking I'm an idiot doesn't matter. There's the risk, the possibility. There's the reality that another human being might be thinking I'm an idiot. And that's going to have an impact because if I miss four or five or six, I tell you what, I'm going to feel like a complete moron. And that made me think, well, to what extent do clients experience this? When they don't do what they say they're going to do, well, how are they experiencing that? Because we might say, I don't judge. This is a non-judgmental safe space. If you didn't do something, we'll explore why you didn't do it. But are we noticing the disavowed feeling of shame or embarrassment you know, one of the, some recent research was done, or it was done a few years ago on supervision, which said that about, I can't remember what the percentage was, but it was high, like 90% of supervisees, i.e. coaches, going to a coach or supervisor wouldn't take their most challenging issue to their supervisor for fear that they would look like they were failing in some way. So the very person they should be taking their most thorny issues to, they weren't taking them to because of the fear of how they might look to that other human being. That would not exist in an AI world. Now, here's the thing. You might say, well, in that case, surely AI is even better. AI doesn't evoke these feelings. But I'm not convinced that's the case in the sense I don't think it's better. I think those feelings have use. Because I know for myself, if I were to miss something two or three times, it's like, next time I've got to do it. Now, in that interim, we can explore why I didn't do it and all that stuff. But there's a force there. There's a new force that's making me think, heck, Nick. You better, you better make a move this time. You better do something. You better show up in some way. And I think that's really, really powerful. So this was my thought experiment. I also remember when I was doing some distance learning once, every time, I think it was with like one of those big university things like Harvard or something, and you would just pay a small fee and you get this course and ever so often you'd get a question. I think it was on positive psychology from memory. 
And then the question would come up like, what's the difference between PERMA and yada, yada, yada? And the idea was you type an essay. And then I thought to myself, nobody's reading this, but I can't move on without typing an essay. So I'm just going to do a full stop. So I do a full stop, move on. Because I knew that nobody was experiencing my thoughts. Nobody was experiencing or caring about what I had to say. So why do I have to do this task? So there's something extremely different between the experience of a human being engaging with a human being and a process engaging with a human being. The question for me is, well, to what extent do we utilize that? To what extent do we allow that to come to the surface in a very recognizable way and say, okay, what do what do we do with that as a, as a, as a dyad, as a coaching dyad? So I want to talk about compassion briefly, because I think this is a critical component of all of this. Compassion, a little bit like the relationship, has been misused, I think, as a word. People think of compassion being about caring and kindness. That isn't compassion from a strictly meaning perspective. Compassion, the root of it means to suffer with. Com is, is with, passion, suffer. Compassion to suffer with. And the question is, well, what are you suffering? What are you suffering to be suffering with if there's compassion? And my answer to that has always been you're suffering the human condition. Well, what is the human condition? It's the inescapables. It's the fact that we all have to make choice and we all suffer with making choice because none of us have absolute perfect clarity on the future or the past or even the present. So we're stuck in uncertainty, ambivalence, fear. We have that. They have that. You have that. We all have it. So there's something incredibly human about the experience of what a client comes to us with in coaching and what we have experienced ourselves in the world as a fellow human. That is something AI simply can't experience because it's not human. So it can't be compassionate. It can emulate compassion. It can be taught to seem to be compassionate, but it's never actually experienced the inability to make a decision. It's never experienced hurt from rejection. It's never experienced failure in the sense of the emotional, the meaning we give failure is, you know, the, the, the emotional impact of what we perceive to be failure it hasn't experienced those things. So there's something about the compassion that lies at the root of the answer to all this, which I'm going to come to later. In other words, if we take this idea of disavowed forces and we take the idea of compassion, we start to put these together in a very useful way. I hope this is all making sense because I realize that I'm sort of kind of not making this up on the spot, but I'm thinking it through with you in a sense. Now, the other thing I want to talk about briefly before I go into the real, you know, the, the real content of this is as I thought about this, I was thinking, well, a lot of this could be perceived to be psychodynamic, psychodynamic stuff. Well, you know, shame is just da 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 da, and oh, you know, fear is it's psychodynamic, it's projection, it's transference, it's hmm, maybe. But I want to approach this more from an existential perspective. What do I mean by that? Well, I think psychodynamics suffers and benefits from such a strong theoretical base that sometimes it it overly dictates the cause of something. So if something is a project if something is from a psychodynamic perspective a projection well it's a defense mechanism if something is a retroflection it's a defense mechanism if something is transference it's a defense mechanism well what's it defending against it's defending against the the discovery of the suppressed unconscious is that what all of this is about that we're talking about tonight i don't think so i think what what i would like to think about this is is, is simply the existential reality that all human beings have certain inescapable conditions that we all have to face it doesn't matter what the strong theoretical base is as such it's just the reality that there's stuff that we cannot escape now look we're not all accountants so that's not an existential condition but we are all living in a place where we don't know what the future holds that's inescapable and that's what makes coaching such a beautiful and yet challenging space, because it's two human beings coming together, both of whom have got stuff going on. Look, AI doesn't have stuff going on. It's like this. Boom. Human beings are like this, which is why when they come together, they're kind of like two little octopuses, octopi, <laughs> little tentacles twisting around each other, because we're two human beings with stuff going on at multiple levels. But it's because it's existentially a given rather than based on what I would say as psychonomic uh, theory. So let's take a let's pause for a second. I'm going to grab a glass, a drink of water. First of all, let me just I don't know if there's a chat box here. Is there a chat box? But it, is this beginning to at least 
from, from a sort of a perspective of what's this whole evening about? Is this making some kind of sense? Where is the chat? Hold on a sec. Give me a sec. Oh, there we go. Oh, maybe the chat's turned off. I'm not sure. Oh, it doesn't matter. So let's, oh, okay. hello and yes. <laughs> Thank you, Julia. Complex strengths. I love it. Um, so I want to talk now about the coaching relationship. Now, I said earlier that I felt it was a bit Pollyanna-esque, and I partly blame Carl Rogers for that. No, I don't. I blame the interpretation of Carl Rogers. Carl Rogers came up with the concept of unconditional positive regard. Very nice sounding, isn't it? Unconditional positive regard. How could we be? How could we object to that? UPR. Uh, by the way, when everything anything gets shortened into an acronym like UPR, you know there's a problem. Because the problem with acronyms is it stops us thinking about them. They become so accepted that we just go, oh, UPR. You know, speak to any counsellor, they will know about UPR. Coaches, not so much so, but unconditional positive regard is still nonetheless, from, from a humanistic perspective, a critical part of coaching. But what are we regarding? I think what we're regarding is the intrinsic ability for humans to face their conditions and grow through them. The problem happens when, once you talk about something like unconditional positive regard and you turn it into a part of a of a of a a named process call it humanistic therapy person-centered therapy coaching is that it becomes kind of made into a safe teachable commodity and that safe teachable commodity that you can measure is things like creating an accepting space where there's no judgment and then if therefore if we can hear you judging something in coaching we mm, you didn't you didn't you know you're you're not ready to qualify as a coach and so what's happened over the years i believe is that cole rogers very complex and multifaceted and deep idea of unconditional positive regard has been simplified into creating a, a kind of a safe space where we talk about clients being creative resourceful and whole but how much do we treat them like that really when we're afraid to bring up stuff that maybe might upset them when we're afraid to say what we're noticing, that is a disavowed force from my perspective of this evening. So I think the UPR has kind of created this place of being overly safe, overly kind, overly unchallenging, or challenging within the parameters of the contract that we can do either at the start or, or in a moment of micro-contracting. Is it okay if I challenge you? Is it okay if I challenge? Yes, that's why I'm paying you. You're my coach. Stop asking me if you can challenge me. But we do that because we're fearful of breaking the UPL, we're fearful of breaking the, the warm relationship we have. And I think that's a real problem. We need to begin to move past. So I want to kind of think about moving away from the banality of the relationship to something much more uh, real. The question for me is what's driving the relationship that does get evoked? Not the one that I would like us to move towards, which could be challenging and confrontational, not confrontational, that's the wrong word, provocative, let's say. I had a chat with um, any of you, you know Yannick Jacob, who does our podcast, and we were talking about provocative coaching. And in our little review of series 13, we talked about prov provocative versus challenging. And uh, sorry, provo provocative versus confronting. And I said that I felt that provocative was more deliberate, but less violent, <laughs> let's say, less violent in its intention. And so I think there's something about how we can be more provocative. But what, what is the relationship? What, what does a relationship evoke? Well, I think it evokes people who want to be liked. We all want to be liked by our coach or by our client, to be accepted by our coach or by our client, to be respected by our coach, by our client, to be trusted by our coach, by our client. These are things that are natural. Now, the question for me is, how much do we allow that natural desire to be liked, accepted, respected, trusted, to drive the coaching and I think we need to be very careful there because the risk is we, this is what causes collusion, by the way. The risk is we want to collude in order to remain liked, to remain accepted in that space. So we need to begin to move away from this, that style of, that style of that relationship. And that allows us to start saying, well, what are the disavowed forces that are in coaching? And to me, here's a few of them. Judgment. Let me, let me, I'm not going to ask you to put your hands up. I'm just going to ask you to think for a second. How many of you can honestly, 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 honestly say to yourself that you never judge a client? You don't need to show any signs. Just think of that in your head. And if you don't, even if you're amazing, even if you're monkish in your ability not to judge, how many of you think your clients know absolutely without question you're not judging them? 
They just know they're in the most monkishly safe space that's ever been created. And there's no judgment, absolutely none at all. Then there's shame. When a client comes to you and they haven't done what they said they're going to do, or there's something they want that they feel they shouldn't want, or that there's a belief they hold that is no longer either socially acceptable or politically acceptable or philosophically acceptable in a given time. How many of you have felt your client has some shame going on about what's happening in the space with you? Annoyance, simple annoyance. How many of you have felt annoyed with your clients? How many of your clients felt annoyed with you? I know there's somebody on this call tonight who was annoyed with me when I was her coach. I still remember it was such a beautiful moment for us. I'm not going to talk about it, but it was a fantastic moment because it really comes to a lot of what I'm talking about tonight, which is the ability to face the reality of the relationship and by confronting it, move through it. Impatience. How many of you feel impatience towards your clients? <laughs> and thank you for your hand up. That's lovely. Thank you. <laughs> um, you know, we want our clients to move forward, but sometimes they don't move forward at the pace we want. Now, you might be absolutely amazing at bracketing your, your aspirations for your clients. Now, I read a fantastic book once called Power in the Help and Professions by Adolf. I know most people aren't called Adolf nowadays, but he was called Adolf Guggenbuhl Craig. And his book was Power in the Help and Professions. And he was a psychoanalyst from the 1970s. And one of the things he wrote about was, in fact, I wrote a blog post about it years and years ago, was the power to fantasize on behalf of your clients. In other words, you might have a different vision for what's possible for them than they have. Now, when that happens, and it's an entirely reasonable thing to do as human beings, there can be an impatience that's bred within that space between where you see them and where they see themselves, or where the pace they're going at and the pace you would like them to go at. So impatience, what about doubt? How many of you hear a client say, I want to achieve this? And you're like, mm, God, really? Are they, are they really going to do that? Oh, I don't know. I'd love, to, I'd love to challenge them. But what if I damage their self-belief? But I don't believe in them. Like, these things happen. What about excitement? How many of you get excited for your clients? I remember um, years ago, Michael Serwa, who's you know, a very successful life coach, and one of the things he said was he doesn't work with any clients who don't inspire him. Instead of him wanting to inspire them, he wants them to inspire him. You know, And I think there's, that's a perfectly reasonable thing to want. But within that, there are certain assumptions, aren't there, about judgment, assessment, let's say, or the, the feelings that are evoked between two people. What about shared assumptions? You know, we're meant to come to this from an existential perspective, we bracket our beliefs. And yet sometimes we can be talking to a client and we're just so much on the same page about what we think is good or bad about the world or what's possible or not possible, that we end up with these shared assumptions. And I remember I was, I was a foreman on a jury case. And um, I don't know if you know the research about judges in Israel. Uh, if a judge, um, if a judge came, sentenced somebody before lunch, it was significantly more, um, what's the word? Non-lenient? What's the opposite of non-lenient? But anyway, it was significantly the opposite of lenient. Anyway, but whatever that word is, than if they sentenced them after lunch. So that's something harsh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ruth. They were significantly more uh, harsh, let's say. I was going to say there was a more technical word, but anyway. Then if they sentenced them after lunch. So I was on this jury case, and we, all of us, completely convinced that this person was guilty of, of it was um, drug trafficking. And as the foreman, it would have been very easy for me to go like, how's it be a great fun? And I said, hey, let's pause for a second because I'm aware it's before lunch and it could be we've accidentally allowed ourselves to collude on this, to be okay with guilty because we want to get it done. And I'm concerned that this is somebody's life that we're play not playing with, but somebody's life we're, we're going to make a decision about. And it's very easy, isn't it, to actually get to that point where you do collude on a belief without even knowing you're doing it. So there's something about how do we how do we make sure that we're extracting ourselves from shared assumptions or naming those shared assumptions? And then what about power? Here's another one, power. The number of times I hear a coach ask a question, and guess what? The client answers it. How often do you hear a client saying, that's the wrong question? 
I know that I do that as a client. I can be a quite annoying client, but I think it's also good because I know what I need to get from a coach. But most clients don't do that. They, they answer the question that's put in front of them because to some degree, there's a power imbalance. We might not like to think there is, but the coach is the one that asks the questions. They control the reins. Now, that might not be the case for all of you. And if you are super person-centered in your approach and you, you move with the flow, great. But a lot of coaches will ask a question that comes up to them and the client will answer it. So we have to be aware of power. What about love? I remember Robin Showett. I don't know if any of you guys know Robin Showett, but Robin Showett wrote a book called um, Love and Fear. No, that was, sorry, that was Eric Dahan. Um, he, Eric Dahan wrote a book on love and fear, but Robin Showett wrote a book called In Love with Supervision. And a lot of what Robin talks about is the, the opposing emotions of love and fear within coaching, within therapy, within coaching relationships in general, within supervision and, and so on and so on. So to what extent is love in your space? And is that being named in some way? And here's the final one I'm gonna give you, and there may be many, many more, because don't forget, I'm talking about disavowed ones here. But the other one is attraction. What happens when the coach is attracted sexually, romantically to the client or vice versa? You know, that is something that gets talked about a lot in therapy. And the concept of transference, romantic, intimate transference, romantic transference, very, very normalized in therapy. Not so much in coaching, but maybe it's something we need to be more aware of because these emotions are under the surface, whether we like it or not. So let me move to. Um, yeah, what, what, what should we look at? Well, in my opinion, what should we be looking to do with all of this? So the first thing to say is we shouldn't be reveling in it. It's not like. Yes, I've got a new swampland to, to dive into and slop around in the mud. That's not the idea. We're not, we're not trying to evoke these feelings because it's like rich and juicy. And there's always the risk when you talk about emotions that we want to kind of evoke them because it feels more rich and it must be more important and so on and so on. I don't think that's true. So we're not trying to create them, nor are we trying to evoke them. I also don't think we're trying to amplify them in the gestalt sense. You know, if you're a gestalt practitioner, you'd be trying to amplify these feelings in some way, because by amplifying them, you, you extract something from them. You find out what they're really about. That's not what I'm suggesting. I'm not saying that's not right or wrong, but it's, it's not what I'm talking about. What I think we're trying to do with this, in my opinion, is, is simply looking to surface what's already there, i.e. shame or fear or love or guilt or you know embarrassment or frustration or annoyance or whatever that, that thing is we're looking to surface what's already there or what's that risk of being there i.e if the client comes to you and they're they're worried about xyz there's a risk of shame embarrassment and so on now we could just ignore that we could just oh, you know it's fine don't worry my 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 belief is that that's not where we're best placed as coaches So a couple of things. First of all, what are the benefits of addressing this stuff? And then I'm going to talk about like how we can do it. But I want to talk about the benefits. The first thing I think is it, it creates a really clear space for the work to take place. I do feel after years and years and years of watching coaches that there's a lot of holding back. I really feel there's a lot of holding back. Coaches want to say something, but they don't because there's some sort of fear or anxiety or is that is that okay does it does it meet the rules of coaching would i become a pcc if i do this or and i think what we need to try to do as coaches is create the clearest space possible it's like these emotions are hiding under the nooks and crannies they're in the dark corner they're under the table a cat sitting on one of them it's under its little warm belly and you need to figure out how you move this cat so you can get to this thing the clearer the space that we can create emotionally the more effective I believe the work can be. Because I really feel like what's happening is that coaches hold back and then the client goes off sort of unsatisfied and the coach goes off sort of unsatisfied and nobody's quite, nobody quite knows why it didn't happen. Why, why this conversation didn't go deep enough. So the first thing is I think we need to create a clear space. Secondly, I think one of the benefits is that we create new awareness for the client about their own emotions, their own motivations, their own barriers. If we don't address the shame, we won't know what's caused it in the first place. So let's let's take a very simple example. Client comes to you, they've said the last two times in a row they're going to write the chapter of their book. 
typically a coach might say, oh, what do you think meant you didn't write that chapter? And the client gives some you know, idea of what, why they didn't. And the coach will say something, okay, what could change next time? Great, perfect, good, good performance coaching. Except for it didn't address the emotion attached to that. Like, how do you feel about not having written that chapter? It's going to bring up a very different conversation than what meant you didn't do it. Because with the what meant you didn't do it or any of those sorts of questions, you're looking at the surface behavioral level. You're not looking at what sits underneath that from a feeling perspective that, that potentially gives a lot more information about what's really, really going on. So that the, the emotion being raised will allow you to kind of figure out what, what really got in the way. So number one, sorry, number two, I believe that by talking about the feelings that sit behind the stuff, you'll create more awareness of the client's motivations and barriers and so on. Next up, you'll, you'll create new insights of their patterns and their beliefs. By allowing yourself to talk about the shame, the embarrassment, the frustration, your frustration, their frustration, you'll be able to enable them to identify patterns and beliefs. What do I mean by that? Well, I think sometimes when we're frustrated, we pay probe that for ourselves. We don't want to be seen to be frustrated because if we're seen to be frustrated, we are judging. And if we're judging, we think it's going to damage the relationship. But if I were to say to somebody, I find myself getting frustrated that each time you come back, and it hasn't been done. This can be a much more a much more robust conversation around. I know I feel that too. All right, so let's identify the pattern here. And it's done at a, a level that has more. What's the word I'm looking for? It has more vitality and more more oomph when we look at it from that perspective than simply what's the behavioral pattern. This is a belief pattern. This is an emotional pattern. This is a frustration pattern. I'm frustrated. You're frustrated. But let me share that with you because I want this to work for you. And none of that is saying you're a bad person. Why? Because it's underpinned by compassion. I've been there too. I've been the person that doesn't get stuff done too. So there's a shared experience of being human. I put it here uh, on my on my notes, no hidden corners. And I, uh, that sort of goes in with the, the clear space for work to take place. But what I mean by no hidden corners is there isn't that sense of like, we don't go there. Now, I don't know if you have that in coaching sometimes where you just feel like there's somewhere we don't go because it's therapy or there's somewhere we don't go because I'm a bit worried about their reaction to it. It kind of looks scary to me as a coach. It's like a little dark corner. My, my wife and I love horror films. And I kind of think, why do people like horror films? Why? I mean, typically they're really badly made, number one. So you wouldn't expect to like them, but somehow we do. And I think it's because it makes you face the feelings that you don't want to have. But by facing them in a safe way, you can start to you can start to move through them. And I think we have to help our clients look in the dark corners of their lives and their beliefs and all these things. Otherwise, we're not allowing them to move through it. And finally, by addressing it, it enables provocative challenge. If I say to somebody. I feel I feel quite frustrated that you've been late for the last three times. And I'm curious what, what, where that lateness is coming from. It's a very provocative statement. It doesn't really allow much room for hiding, but nor is it like, I've noticed you've been late. How can we make sure you're on time next time? Because it's not about managing them. I'm not interested in managing them. I'm interested in what is this information telling me about what's going on for them? But if I just go, mm, would it be okay if you're on time or some softy pofty equivalent of that? I'm not helping them face what's really going on here. I remember years ago, there was somebody that really wanted to work with me. This was years and years ago. And um, they really wanted to work with me. And they couldn't, they couldn't afford my fees, but they had a really like quite deep issue. So I decided I'd work with them for free. And on the very first session, they turned up half hour late. And I could have just gone, oh, no problem. Don't worry. Don't worry. You know, make yourself comfortable. Let's be mindful for a fight. You know, let's be mindful for a minute. I don't do mindfulness, by the way, but I could have, you know, let's be mindful, grind your feet and let's take some deep breaths and arrive here. Like, no, you really wanted to work for me and you're half hour late. What does that mean? What is that saying? What's not being spoken here? Is that is that lateness coming from a fear of what's going to unfold in the session? By the way, this isn't for me to interpret. This isn't me saying, is it coming from fear? It's, it's me saying, what does that lateness mean? We've got to address it. Because if we're not addressing it, we're just managing it away. We're going to feel annoyed. And I, by the way, I've seen this so often. Coaches saying, my client's always late. What do I do about that? 
It's not an issue to be managed away, it's an issue to be explored. Now, what are the risks of addressing it? Well, a clumsy intervention could damage a relationship, no question. This is, this is, this is, a, I wouldn't say it's a new skill, kind of is. Your ability to name what's in front of you in a way that's compassionate, that allows you to name what feels like a judgment for you, but which you attribute no truth to. Let me say that again. It feels like a judgment, but you attribute, attribute no truth to it. That's an interesting one, isn't it? We can judge somebody, but we can also recognize that judgment is simply a personal experience. And once we recognize those two things can live together, we can talk about the judgment without it being a judgment. It's your phenomenological experience of this person that you interpret as a judgment, but which is now up for grabs between you. Does that make sense? And I, and so, um, where, where was I going with this? Oh yeah, the, 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 the clumsy intervention. Yes, it is a skill. And I would say it's probably a skill to practice with people. Practice it with your partner or your friends or, or get a, a client that you're who's willing to kind of contract with you for to do that. Because you could go in, and I don't know if any of you read um, Helping the Client by John Heron, but he talks about three intervention types, and they're authentic, I think it's authentic, authentic, degenerate, and perverse. And the degenerate, I always forget which one's which, the perverse intervention is an intervention which you mean well, but goes badly. I think it's that way around. And the other one, the generator or vice versa, is an intervention which you do for your own sake. In other words, you, you do an intervention for the client, but really you're doing it for yourself, to feel better about yourself or to get a particular outcome or whatever. There's a risk that you do that here, like, whoa, new material to explore. And you do it because you're curious. And there's a sort of a kind of a salaciousness to figure out where's the shame in this space. That would be a degenerate intervention. You want to avoid that. But I can see how easy it would be to fall into that in the initial time. So just, just be careful of that one. Secondly, there's the risk that you start to interpret rather than describe. What I'm talking about here is the ability to allow it to the surface or to describe in emotions and behaviors which suggest something is going on beyond the surface side of things. What I'm not doing is saying you are being X. I mean, I'm feeling impatient because you are X. The minute you interpret, you turn your, your, your experience into a truth. It might be your truth, but you turn it into a truth. And then the client's got to wrestle with your truth. Like, no, that's not true because, rather than, hmm, is that how you feel? Oh, interesting, I didn't see it that way myself. That's a very different conversation, isn't it, between a coach and a client. When a client can say to you as a coach, oh, is that how you felt? Oh, wow. That's interesting. It wasn't like that for me. That's very different from, no, no, you're wrong. Because the minute they say you're wrong, it's because you've said something that interprets their behavior as some kind of truth in your eyes. The next thing you want to do is, is well, sorry, the next risk of addressing these things is that you reinforce, you reinforce their beliefs. So at one level, this is a beautiful way to bring out their beliefs. Another is potentially, if you do it badly, you risk reinforcing their beliefs i.e. that sh the shame they're feeling is a natural consequence of their behavior. Rather than something that can be looked at in order to move through, it becomes something to look at because it belongs there. This shame belongs there. You should do what you say you're going to do. You should be more committed. All of a sudden, you reinforce existing beliefs of worthlessness or failure or whatever it might be. And the final thing is it can take coaching off track by becoming navel gazy. You become so kind of into the whole idea of looking at emotions that you cease to work on the contract of the coaching. So those are the risks of doing this. Now, the risks of not doing it, you have an in inauthentic relationship. And I think, honestly, this sounds really bad. I'm going to say this. Maybe I'll get uh, my video guy to delete this from this from this talk. But I can't help it. I think most coaching relationships are inauthentic. I think most coaches play the game of coaching and they're really afraid of not being a coach. And I think a lot of clients play the game of being a client. I'm not talking about TA games here, although that's certainly part of this. You know, different ego states and all this kind of stuff, all the rules of the game. I'm just talking about the basic process of knowing what you're meant to do 
and being afraid to not do it. And that to me is not authentic. And I, I, I you know, I've had enough conversations with coaches in the past where that's been really the, 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 the centrality of our conversation. It's like, in fact, there are a few people here who do my supervision course. And then one of my, one of my um, alumni from that course said to me, one of the most impactful things I said in that course was when she said, I'm trying to remember exactly what it is, but she says something like, How do, you know, I can't, I'm sorry, I'm, this wasn't planned, but she said to me, one of the most impactful things was when I said to her, essentially be yourself as a supervisor. I don't remember the full context, but it was like, just be yourself first. Like that's the number one rule. And it kind of gave her freedom to say, okay, I don't have to be like a supervisor. I have to be like me. And if I can be like me with the job that I've got to do, then I'm supervising. It's a different mindset. And I think a lot of coaches be a coach rather than be a me, not me, <laughs> be a version of them with a job to do called coaching. Next up, the risk of not addressing this, clients' fears are left to fester. What I mean by that is clients aren't stupid. If you're judging them, they know it. If you are impatient with them, they know it. Even if you're not judging them, they think you are, because it's what all human beings have lived through all their life. And don't forget them, a great book by Irvin Yellom called Love's Executioner. Maybe some of you read it, Existential Psychotherapist. And um, he wrote this particular chapter about um, a very large, overweight lady. And he talks about the fact that he himself was repulsed, he said. I, I, I was repulsed by um, people being overweight. But his job is to be a therapist with unconditional positive regard. So, of course, he was his, her therapist. He, he came through that and he realized, God, my judgments are so, so shocking and da la 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 and at the end, he said, I, I've got to tell you something. And he confessed that all when he first met her, how repulsed he was. And she said, what? And you thought you hid that. So I think we have to recognize that clients aren't silly. They know that we're a human being. This is where I can see the flip side of compassion is that you also judge and you also have these things that make you human. So they don't think of you as AI. Thankfully, they don't think of you as AI. They think of you as a human and humans judge and humans get frustrated and humans get annoyed and humans do all the stuff that humans do. And you're one. I don't know if you look in the mirror recently, but when you look in the mirror, you'll see you're a human. <laughs> that's a good thing. But just recognize that clients know you're human too. So they know you're feeling stuff. So the risk is if we don't address this, they go away thinking, my coach must think I'm a right idiot. But they don't know what you're really thinking because you're not addressing it. You're not having that courageous conversation. So then they come back going, oh, oh, last week it was bad enough. But now I've not done this as well. This is mounting up. My ledger account is on in the red with this coach. They don't know what you're thinking because you're not having the courageous conversation to talk about how you're feeling. You might be having the courageous conversation to challenge them or why they're not doing stuff, but you're not saying how you're feeling about it. So they're left wondering, what does she really think? What does he really think? What do they really think? Now, the next reason why I think there's a risk of not addressing it is there's actually power in your reflections. I've told this story quite a lot, but years ago I was, and I was recording these sessions for my community. It was all contracted and I was recording the sessions. And my particular client at the time was typing, taking notes, taking notes, taking notes. And one of my my students at the time who was listening to the session said, Nick, you should tell her to close her laptop and stop taking notes because it's, and she needs to be more present. And I said, but what would I miss about how she does life by managing her way, her behaviors? So at the appropriate time, I was able to say, hey, Gail, her name was, hey, Gail, I noticed that as we've been coaching, you've been typing, typing, typing. I'm curious, what's that typing about? And what transpired was really it was a reflection of her desire to capture everything we talked about so that she could control the outcome. And actually the whole premise of our coaching was really control. It was really letting go of control. And yet there she was typing, 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 typing. Now, had I managed away her behaviors rather than allowing myself to name her behaviors, the blind spot would have stayed in place. All right. So I'm just going to take another sip. Give me a sec. Any chats coming through? No, that's okay.
by the way, can I just check? Is this is this is is, is, is this kind of interesting? Just give me a little because I'm just um, realizing I'm, it's it's very new for me how I'm thinking about this. But is it um, broadly interesting? You're still here, which I guess is a good sign. Thank you so much. See, I need validation too. <laughs> Um, so, okay, I'm going to move into the final stretch now, which is how do we how do we do this? How do we harness these emotions? Thank you so much, everyone. So the first thing I think we need to really, really be aware of is that compassion is the root of all of this. And I don't mean showing compassion. I mean having compassion. It's a very different thing. Showing compassion is an act. Being compassionate is a way of being. Being compassionate is recognizing you'll know better or no worse than somebody, but you're all essentially human. You're all essentially struggling with the same stuff, the big stuff, making choices, figuring out what your life is worth, figuring out how you fit in society. So when you are compassionate rather than show compassion, the compassion will show through. I really believe that. I believe the more we genuinely believe, like genuinely believe that you're no better and no worse than anyone else, the more we can start to have these courageous conversations in a way that people just won't feel judged. Because you also do this stuff. You also miss the left turn multiple times. You know, that's just part of life. So, so the first thing I think we need to figure out is whatever feeling we're going to explore. When I say that, I don't mean, right, today I'm going to explore shame. I mean, whatever feeling that you, every feeling is sort of emerging in that space, where does it reside? Is it with the client? Is it with you? Or is it somehow shared? You see, it could be the client thinks you're frustrated with them, but you're not. So the feeling is with the client. It could be you are frustrated with the client, in which case it's with you. It could be the client thinks you're frustrated and is worried about it. You are frustrated. It exists for both of you. So I think the first thing is to figure out where it exists. And when I say figure out, I don't mean in a kind of logical tick box exercise. I just mean to have that question. Where is this? Where's this coming from? And it might be you feel there's some kind of shame in the space. You're like, where, where is, I'm feeling some shame, but where's that coming from? Or it might be you're just like, how do you feel about not having done that? And they say, oh, I just feel so embarrassed. Okay, let's explore that embarrassment. Don't just sweep it away and go, don't, no, 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 don't be embarrassed. We just got to figure out what needs to change for you. Which in a way, I know it wouldn't be as blatant as that, but that's kind of the meta frame of most coaching. I didn't do it. How do you feel? I feel embarrassed. No, don't be embarrassed. There was just something that wasn't right. Well, what if we explore that embarrassment? Where's that really coming from? What is it saying about themselves, their self-image, about what they really want? All these things about whether you think they should be embarrassed or not. And can you convey that in a way that is meaningful? Like if you're just like, no, no, you shouldn't be embarrassed, but they can see in your eyes that you think they're a loser then it's just words. You've got to really feel like, no, 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 there's no embarrassment here, but what's that embarrassment about? It's very different from, no, 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 don't be embarrassed. What could you do differently next time? In other words, you dive into the embarrassment, but what you're not doing is, in my opinion, is you're not amplifying it. You're not doing a gestalt approach. You're not amplifying for the sake of amplification. You're just saying, let's stay with it for a second. So number one, where does it reside? Is it with the client, with you, or with both? Next up is, to my mind, is what does an honest conversation sound like? And I don't mean you're not, you're not asking yourself that in the moment, but I mean, really, as a coach, I think that's a question we need to be engaging with all the time, whether you're in supervision, whether you're reflecting on yourself. How honest was I as a coach today? How honest was I as a human being? I think that's a, such an important question because I just think, look, I, I feel like I'm being very critical of coaches and I don't mean to be, but I just feel that there's too much game playing in coaching and therapy, by the way. Therapy is just as bad, in my opinion, that we game play too much. I think a great meta question for us to have is how honest was I with this person? Did I walk away going, I would have loved to have asked that, but I couldn't. Why not? What, why, why, why couldn't you ask that? Why couldn't you say that? My sense is that we should be creating the cleanest, most honest space possible so that when two people come together, they can engage in a conversation that's both courageous and compassionate. And those, in a sense, they're, you know, flip side of the same coin. 
the compassion allows for courage because the compassion says, look, I'm with you. I experience this. I'm a human too. So my, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? My um, suggestion, it's not the word I'm looking for, but my suggestion to you is, is really think about how honest you're being in your coaching and how could you be more honest in a way that's true to you? Like my version of honesty might be different from somebody else's. I, I was having a chat recently with a friend of mine and he did a radical retreat, radical honesty retreat. And he was saying what they were taught to say in this retreat was, it was a very weird phrase. It was something like, um, I am making myself bored. I, I'm making myself bored with you. So if you feel bored with somebody, the radical, radical honesty thing will taught you this phrase, I'm making myself bored. And I said, but how honest is that? Really? Because are you making yourself bored? Or are you finding yourself bored? Like making yourself bored is a very active state, isn't it? And there was something like by trying to take ownership of that, that feeling, it was actually still being dishonest. Because in a way, boredom is something you find yourself in. You don't kind of go like, right, I'm going to make myself. Because if you can make it, you can also unmake it. But I suppose what I'm saying to you is find what honesty looks like to you. For me, my honesty is almost always starts with I find myself. That, that feels that that little phrase works for me beautifully. I do it with my team. I do it with clients. I do it with anyone with my wife, I find myself feeling this because that's the truth of my experience. I don't create a feeling. I don't go looking for a feeling. I certainly don't manufacture it because otherwise I could anti-manufacture it. I find myself feeling it. But you see, in that finding, you're not imposing interpretation. You're finding yourself with a feeling. The feeling is the feeling. What's causing that is for you to now work out between you. That's my approach. Now you need, I think you need to find out what an honest conversation sounds like to you. Wait a sec. Okay. Next up is, um, how do you surface the client's experience? You see, what, what I notice in the relational world of coaching is it's pretty much all about the coach's experience. Robin Sherritt is a fantastic supervisor and fantastic coach, but a lot of his stuff is fear. I'm, I'm feeling fear. Okay, great. But what are they feeling? So I think there's still a massive amount of power in using clean inquiry to find out what co the client's experience, which is going back to my question, or my, my statement of if they come and they haven't done something and they say they're embarrassed, surface the embarrassment. Don't just ignore it, but equally you don't say, I find myself feeling this. You're just like, tell me about the embarrassment. Tell me more about that. In other words, you surface their experience of the thing that's been disavowed, the shame, the embarrassment, the frustration, whatever it is. How are you experiencing this? Where's that coming from? How does it feel like? Where have you experienced it before? What might it be a reflection of? Yada, 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 all these questions, classic coaching questions, but you're surfacing it from them. And the last one I put on my little list is the power of phenomenology. For those of you who came to my lecture last year on phenomenological principle, um, you know, this is really, really central to Animas, central to all coaching, but very explicitly to Animas, which is that the client's phenomenological experience is foremost in our work, but so is yours. And what I suggest you start doing is really paying attention to, to, to your inner world Within that, within that conversation. Now, often phenomenology is, is treated as only the feeling side of things. But to my mind, your thinking is also phenomenological. You're experiencing thinking. In other words, traditionally in phenomenology, you, you have the experience of something and then you interpret something. But I believe the interpretation is itself a phenomenological act, which you can reflect on. In other words, you reflect on your interpretation as much as you do on the feeling stuff. Make sense? So instead of only saying, I find myself feeling fear, or there feels like fear here, you might say, I find myself thinking that it's this. But what's your interpretation of it? So you're offering ideas to be wrestled with, but you're not imposing them as some defined truth. Can I explain again, how would you bring up frustration with the client being late without putting frustration on them? Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. 
Well, we're going to, go, we're going to do a Q&A shortly, actually, Wendy. So I will come to that um, in the Q&A section. Q&A. Sounds like I've got any answers. Um, <clears throat> all right. So last little bit. Conclusion. Where are the conclusion? I'll do Q&A. So really, let me wrap all this up. I'm going to take one more sip of water. So let me wrap all this up. Do I think AI can replace humans as coaches? I don't. I really, really don't. Until AI becomes human or has the experience of being human that's so equivalent of humanity that it might as well be called humanity, I don't see it. In fact, years ago, I used to say that once all the jobs were replaced by robots and AI, the last things left for humans was being human. And I still believe that. I, I think there are certain professions that are intrinsically about being human. And I think coaching and therapy are amongst, amongst that kind of group. I don't think AI can replicate it. I think AI can do an amazing job at certain things, but it can't be human until it is human. Being human is about being frail, fragile, vulnerable, mistaken, fearful, and all the stuff that we avow hopeful, aspirational, inspirational, positive, etc. So number one, I think we're safe as a profession. I do think certain tranches of coaching could be replaced, particularly the more performance-based coaching, where it's more about planning. But I think the stuff that we do, Animas, and if, or anyone outside of the Animas world here who's transformative or psychologically oriented, or whatever those things might be, I think that can't be replaced because it's fundamentally about being human. I do hope that on the back of this, though, I've given you new areas to explore, that instead of hitting a certain wall in your coaching where you think, oh, but there's something not being said, I hope you'll say it. I hope you'll go there. I hope you'll help the client see that you're not feeling what they think you're feeling or that you are feeling what you th they think you're feeling. And it's OK that you feel that because you're human. But that doesn't mean you can't get through it. It's okay to, to go to Wendy's question. It's okay to be frustrated. There's nothing wrong with being frustrated. The question is, is it gonna, is it gonna ruin the relationship beyond repair? I doubt it. I suspect the frustration will make your relationship stronger because you've actually been honest. You've actually said that you feel frustrated. Now, to go to Wendy's question, what does frustration look like when it's done badly? You're really annoying me. Will you stop being late? It's not okay. That's frustration revealing itself. As opposed to, I find myself feeling frustrated about this. In which case you are talking about the emotion, you're not, you're not doing the emotion. Does that make, do you see the difference? You're not doing the emotion, you're talking about the emotion. And it's okay, you have an emotion. They know you've got an emotion, they know it. They look at you and they go, that person's got wrinkles. They're not one year old. In fact, even a one year old has got emotions, but that person's lived life They've got wrinkles, they've been married, they've been divorced, they've had a job, they've got fired or they've resigned or whatever's happened to you. And you're like, they know that you're not some pure, unadulterated, non-emotional coaching machine. Believe me, they know it. And the, the more we realize they realize you're human, the more we can be human. That's that's kind of my take, that's sort of my big take on this. So. I don't think this is a new skill I'm teaching you here at all. But what I do think it is, is it's a new area for you to open up in your coaching if you're not already doing it. Use your coaching skills. Use your ability to name what you feel or see without imposing truth on it. Don't forget, from at least from an animus perspective, coaching is simply an epistemological relational, um, an epistemological relational stance, i.e. it's about knowledge and it's about relationship. So if I impose truth on it, i.e. this feeling I've got is true, or this, this interpretation is true, that's when you're no longer coaching. But you can be coaching to acknowledge you have a feeling, to acknowledge you have a belief, to acknowledge you have an interpretation, but it's not true, it's up for grabs between you relationally. That's pure coaching. because you're. And by the way, it's also pure unconditional positive regard because you're imbuing them with the sense-making power to engage in a wrestling match with you about something that's going on between you without worrying that they're going to collapse into a bundle of emotion. That's real UPR, isn't it? 
And so finally, I believe that as a result of this, it will help you become more authentic as a coach. I really, I really do believe that. And I, I wish that for you. <clears throat> the last thing to say is that I did say at the start, this was meant to be the talk I was going to give at our summit. If you've not yet seen our summit, it's on 9th of November. Do check it out. It's called The Vitality of the Human Presence in Coaching. It's completely free to attend. Amazing speakers, but it's really going to pick up on a lot of these, a lot of these themes. So I think you'll appreciate kind of going a bit deeper uh, with it. All right, guys, that's me finished. I'm going to stop the recording and just see if there's any Q&A.